Oh yes, it's good to be back with you again, this little haven of sanity, this corner of rationality on the internet in a world that goes increasingly bonkers. Uh, let me introduce you to our amazing panel this week. It's the one-man pre-Cambrian explosion of internet creativity. Yeah, a special reference there for Stephen J. Gould fans, it's John Biggs! And on the other side of the room, she's the author of Shiny Bits in Between. And also, one of our top narrators here on Pop Ups from Texas. It's Georgina Key. Hey, John. Good to see you. Howdy. How's yeah, life over there in Brooklyn? Uh, it's fine right now. It's coming back to life, I guess you could say, and uh, things are changing for the better. So I think it's uh, it's going to be good. Good. Well, that's encouraging. That's nice and positive. Mm -hmm. um, you you got a, a book recommendation for us this week? Uh, what did I say? I've been what? reading a lot of books. What did I read? What did I read this week? Let me give you a hint. Oh, this one. Yeah, this was yes. great. Okay, so this was Pachinko. Yeah. Uh, so this was an odd one. It was I didn't think I would like it. I don't like long like family history kind of stuff. Mm. Uh, mm. But this was fascinating. It was about Korean uh, Korean settlers in Japan and basically how they had to survive. Yes. And it's and it's written by a uh, Korean American woman who went back and did amazing amounts of research and basically found the deepest and richest story that she could find out of that out of that particular uh, I guess uh, migration. So I, I got a real big kick out of it. I feel quite bad that I haven't even read it. It's it's a very long book, isn't it? I mean, not not so long. I mean, just uh, just open it, start page one. You can just keep going. So that's that's very interesting actually because it's this, it's been described as the sweep of Dickens and Tolstoy applied to a 20th, 20th mm -hmm. century Korean family and it is a saga but um, from all the reviews and it's got amazing reviews it's a, it's actually a real page turner. It it's well written. Uh, it's not. It's uh, somebody called my writing workmanlike once. Uh, so it's very mm -hmm. similar to that. Uh, and I'm not sure if that was a compliment. It's not. I mean, it's not Dickens or Tolstoy by any stretch of the imagination. It's it's very. Uh, but it's it is a page turner. You're going to want to keep going. That's fantastic. That's a great recommendation. I will definitely put that on my reading list. Thank you very much, John. Georgina, how are you down in the? Is it the Gulf of Texas you are? Yeah. Yeah. And how's everything there? Are you in the eye of the no. storm, or is everything as, as cool as John? Um, no, it's it's not. It's very crazy. It's crazy. It's insane, <laughs> and it's only going to get worse. Actually, I've no, I've got a weather know, forecast for it. It's only going to get worse. Um, so to take our to take our mind off what's going on outside there, you got a reading recommendation for us? I do. But before I do that, I want a second pachinko. It was really good. Oh, really? This is really? how long it is. <laughs> oh, it's not bad. I could I could manage that. Yeah, yeah that's okay. Good. That's cool. Excellent. I could read it. But but my recommendation is um, Station Eleven. Okay. By I think John Mandel. Yeah. And you'll be thrilled to hear, Pete. It is a dystopian novel. Ooh. It's about <laughs> a flu worldwide flu epidemic. That's no. that. Uh, oh, I mean, how how, how old is it? Did she predict this from years ago? 2014. Right. Okay. Yeah. She's a Canadian writer, young Canadian writer, and um, it's basically it's it goes back and forth 20 years. So it, it starts when the pandemic first erupts. Yeah. And within weeks, you know, half the population has died, and then it jumps to 20 years ahead when people are uh, you know how they're living then, and just goes back and forth, and it's it's equally horrifying. But also, it's so well written, really yeah. well written, and um, the characters, it's very character driven, actually. It's not like sci fi, it's very grounded in reality. That's terrific. It's, isn't it it's extraordinary? <laughs> Well, I know, yeah, right. Isn't it extraordinary how dystopian novels are really doing well at the moment? You think that people wouldn't, you know, would have had enough of it really outside yeah. their windows. I'm one of those but... people. I watch all the shows and the movies and read yeah. The books. yeah, yeah. Maybe in an attempt to find out what's going to happen next. Two fantastic books, huh? <laughs> from two extraordinary guests. Thank you both. Uh, this is where we are at the moment. We're looking at submissions from the twenty-first of June. But you can send a priority submission, and if you do that, 
It helps us too. Well, mildly it does. Now, this is what happened last week. If you remember, we had excellent submissions, actually, from Lilo35. Hannah gave us spell. Matthew gave us the cold case of Charity McGuinness. And Laura gave us Panther's Thread. Followed up last, but by no means least, from Ray. Earthlings, the beginning. Now, what, what can I tell you? What can I tell you? Well, I can tell you that this is what happened at the end of the show. Ali, is you can, if you so wish, change your vote on one submission today, but only one. No, I think I'll stay where I am. Very good. I understand and respect that. Mm-hmm. Tex, are you going to stick or twist? I have spoken. Let it be so. <laughs> <laughs> And that is so tax, isn't it? Um, now, we had a strange situation happen. Um, possibly something that's a little, I don't know, precursor as to what's going to happen in a few days in a certain uh, election in the States. Um, we had really clear, obvious voter spoofing going on. And we've never had that before. The past six and a half days, somebody or maybe a group of people, I don't know, Albanians has been suggested, no racial slurs, <laughs> um, has been uh, busy... Um, messing around with our system. Well, whoever you are, you're a complete wanker, actually. And I don't care who you are, but but you spoil the fun of a lot of people. So just don't do it again. Um, So I've been scratching my head and I've taken expert advice from uh, our panelists here. And we have decided, actually, that instead of not having a winner, we are going to have a winner. And it's going to be the person that our panelists last week decided on. That's the one. Hannah Fillon. <laughs> well done, Hannah. A triumph over adversity, eh? Yeah, very nice. Very pleased about that. Um, let's get straight into our first submission of the week. It's from Jacob. And as you can see, there's a QR code there. You can go to whatever corner of the internet Jacob wants you to go to. It could be exciting. It's science fiction. Yes, I feel like some of that. It's called Foreign Land, and this is Jacob's blurb. Smith's wife dies when they leave their generation ship only to crash on a new planet. While trying to stay connected to his son, Smith must survive interdimensional monsters. Ooh, monsters from the air, I wonder. And bizarre biotech that invade his mind and threaten his sanity. Back in space, the inhabitants of the generation ship face off against a threat that could destroy all of humanity. These two stories crash together in a fast-paced, character-driven novel that examines grief, regret, and the beauty of the universe. And let me tell you about Jacob, shall I? Jacob is currently an unpublished author. Uh, see if we can sort that out for you. Um, actually, one of our um, submissions just the other week got a five-book deal. Isn't that great? Five-book deal. So it can happen. Uh, unpublished author, BFA in English Education and an MA in English and Creative Writing. Very good. Well, you sound very serious and committed, Jacob. So the least we can do is to give you an equally serious and committed reader is K. Foreign Land by Jacob Sherwood. Read by Kay. Smith stood on the small mound of grey dirt leaning on his shovel. The brown circles of his eyes were surrounded by the red of exhaustion and despair. His son sat a few yards off, knees bent, bald head hung down. Abe was nearly 16, but in that moment Smith saw him as the young boy who had been afraid of the dark. A cool wind blew Smith's long grey hair into his sweat-soaked face. He drew deep breaths his large chest moving slowly up and down. The helmet of his survival suit lay on its side at his feet, the clear glass cracked. Thankfully, the air was breathable, so now he only wore his issued suit, crimson red with black side stripes, to keep him warm. Something in the air of that new world irritated his skin and he kept scratching at the speckled scruff that covered his face. That new planet. Ethera his new hell. He looked around at what had been accomplished in the last few hours. Fifteen shiny colony domes sat in a perfect row, fresh from their vacuum-sealed packaging. The purified white of the structures shone even brighter against the bland landscape. Fourteen of them were exactly fifteen feet across. 
The last was twice that size and had been meant for the captain and her family. Now it was being used as triage for the injured. Smith watched as two men carried a woman through its doors. Even from that distance he could tell she'd lost a leg. To the east of the domes in the distance, a range of mountains stretched north and south as far as he could see. At the base, the peaks were ashen, just like the dirt he dug in. It slowly changed to a dusty red as the elevation increased and the top of each was white with snow. They pierced into the grey-orange sky that Smith would have found beautiful under different circumstances. But that night it felt ominous, as if it would simply cave in at any moment, and if it had, he wasn't sure he'd mind all that much. They had planned to land on the other side of the peaks where the treetops reached to the sky and the roots weaved strongly into moist, healthy soil, but they had ended up in the dark, dusty emptiness that surrounded him. With no rover or ground transports in working order, they had decided to set up where they were. South of where he stood, the desert went on and on, growing colder with each mile. To the north, past the horizon, a vast ocean that covered over half the planet. Based on the pictures the drones had sent back, the largest animals on the planet lived on these waters. Cascading clear green water estimated to reach depths of over 10,000 feet. Shadows appeared just below the surface. Long oval-shaped creatures that sped through the waters at blistering speeds. Smith had been most excited to see the ocean. He'd never had the chance to see it on Earth. But now he wondered whether he would survive long enough to see it. Whether any of them would. A few hundred yards past the domes to the west lay the bent, smouldering husks of their ship. Something had gone wrong when they entered the atmosphere. All Smith knew was that he had seen flames, heard explosions and awoke covered in burns, cuts and dirt. He helped the others salvage what and who they could. Fifteen colony domes, 121 total survivors, some clothing, enough foodstuffs to last 121 people about two months, two crates of tools and one crate of weapons. Between Smith and the mangled metal were at least 20 other survivors, all digging for the same reason Smith was, all burying their loved ones. Smith burying his wife, Evelie, gone. Sylvia, Evelie's sister, walked silently up and sat by Abe. With a gut-wrenching cough, Smith turned back to his mound and shovel. The gravity there was much stronger than what he was used to, double what it had been back on the ship of nations. Half a G more than on Earth. Okay, that's quite a lot of G. Um, feels a little bit generic to me. Uh, is your cup of tea, Georgina? I wonder. Um, well, I don't read a lot of sci-fi, but um, no. uh, I enjoyed the world building. And his, he's a good writer, I think, but um, there was a little too much of it. I think it would be more effective if it was sprinkled throughout the narrative and he introduced us to this planet and the dairy is on the planet uh, while the story, while, I mean, and I, so I don't, there's no, not, not really any action going on and we, we're not very much inside the character's head so we don't know yeah. much about him except that no. his wife died and he's with his son. Yeah. It would have been nice to engage with the character first and then get into some storytelling. Yeah, no, I I agree with that. Um, I bet you're a sci-fi. I bet you're a sci-fi maven, John. Are you? Not specifically. I like it. Um, I think the. I think in this specific case, there are there. A there's this is kind of like the plot of every other uh, story, and I was mm. kind of expecting something like a Cormac McCarthy, oh, yeah. the road situation, but instead I immediately get. I don't know, uh, raised by wolves or whatever, um, where you have the aliens ta or the robots taking care of the kids and uh, yeah. and that sort of that sort of post calamity fiction is pretty popular right now, specifically since there's the, the, like we're talking about the dystopian stuff. So yep. how do you survive a calamity? I'd much rather hear about how he and his son survives a calamity than I don't know, hear about 50 other people who are in these uh, these pods and things. It feels a little bit ensemble when it should probably just be a solo solo gig. Yeah, yeah. 
I agree with that. I think with that... the cameras being held, you know, onto the onto the planet, and we're filming. This is like the intro to the movie, and we're just scanning. Mm-hmm. The, yeah, you know, the, the, we're seeing pictures. And I, I didn't. Know, yeah, and I didn't like anything that I saw, right? So I got frustrated because I didn't. No. I got. I was. I wanted them to stop for a minute and just like take the a look at something cool. Kind of, the first paragraph kind of enticed me. I liked it. Mm-hmm. I expected. Like, it was a good like, writer. Uh, it's a good writer. Expected something different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Shades of the Martian is. It's not as gripping as the Martian. Um, yeah. However, I mean, I think the general observation coming out that's going to uh, completely piss off a lot of uh, uh, viewers and listeners, but I think that sci-fi as a whole doesn't often give as much attention as it needs to to character building and often sort of, you know, is more interested in the big ideas and the big concepts and things, mm-hmm. Greg, Greg Bear stuff. So I don't know how, how hard the buyer is in this case, the buyer is in this case. So, John, you've got up to five points to dispense in your largesse. And you're a very generous man. I know that. How many points are you going to give? Uh, I'll give this one a three. three. That's more than good of you, Georgina. Same for me, three. A three. Okay. Um, I'm going to I'm going to be slightly less generous because um, I you know you know the view I always take is just commercial, right? And what agents want as they just want to take something in, do, don't do any work. Fantastic prose, fantastic opening, fantastic uh-huh. title. I know exactly who to sell it to. Bung it out and make some money. Is it is it ready for that? No, it's not. So I'm going to go for two. Oh, yeah. Sorry, everybody hates me, but then I'm an agent. I've got no feelings. Um, great. All right, let's move on. That's not a bad start. Let's move on. And see what we've got next. My name's Daisy War. I'm an author. My next novel is coming out in February. It's called In the Crypt of the Candlestick. And I have a writing tip for you, and that is uh, like your reader. Try, try to imagine that you like the person you're writing for. I think that, I, I, and respect them that you're talking to a friend. I think that makes it altogether warmer and, and also more fun to write. Thanks. And to read more people. <laughs> Bye. Uh, thank you very much, Daisy. Hopefully we'll have you back soon, because uh, she's terrific, actually. And yes, she is. She is part of that family, part of that eminent family. We have them all on here, don't we? This is from Dan. Dan Jones. Good name, that, Dan. Um, QR code at the bottom. This is an interesting genre you've invented here. SF, horror, literary, industrial thriller. Wow. I think, um, well, I don't think there's that much competition there. Uh, the Hole in the Sky. Good title. This is your blurb. Grub Tang the world's only psychotect, produces designs for living things from his unconscious mind in a world where almost all animal life died after a viral outbreak, oh, I can't get away from it, called the crash. It's a valuable skill. After an accident erases Grubb's gift, he's sacked by the Nunes Alessia Psychitecture Europa Corporation. I need name, brand name consultants, aren't they? Embittered, he joins cyber terror group T127 for revenge, but T127 prove as exploitative as his ex-employers, and Grubb is left wondering what it means to be truly free. All right. Um, let me tell you a bit about Dan. Um, Dan says, my debut no- novel, Man of War, was published in 2018 by Snowbooks. I'm currently working on my next novel, tentatively titled The Green Man, about a 14th century French Benedictine monk who travels to northern England to investigate a spate of mysterious infant disappearances. It plays as a cross between the name of the rose and the X-Files. I like the sound of that very much. Hopefully you'll let us see that. Outside writing, I work for the UK Space Agency on a programme developing AI and robotics for next generation commercial space missions. This experience and knowledge directly informs my writing, particularly where I cover themes of corporatism, robotics and the ethics of new technologies. Cutting edge stuff. And again, I suspect that uh, John Biggs is going to be interested by this. Let's hope he, he will be. Cutting edge stuff. Got a cutting edge reader for you. It's Emily. The, first the Hall in the Sky by Dan. Read by Emily. Grub one. Peering out from the alley, Grubb sighed at the chaos on Zanfuststrasse. The protests had doubled, rolling along the great thoroughfare of Norstengrass. 
gobbling up every inch of space. He tipped two red pills from his pillpot into his shaking, disfigured right hand. A firecracker of pain arced through his head, and he winced. Not now. Please. Screams, gunshots, anti-corporate chanting, and other violent noises mixed with popping in his head, until it became one cacophonous din. Ashley would be expecting him by now, but he couldn't ignore his brainstorm. His trembling right hand, possessing only thumb and ring finger, couldn't hold the pills, and they tumbled to the floor. No! He dropped to his knees, scrabbling on the wet pavement to find them. The migraine smashed hammers inside his skull. His pulse quickened, and only rabbit breaths escaped his lungs. Please, where are you? Grinding his teeth and swearing, Grub splashed his hands desperately in the puddles, until at last his robotic left hand brushed against the little gel caps. He whimpered joyfully as he gathered and swallowed them, and rolled onto his back, clenching his face and muttering nonsense until they took effect. Eventually his pulse slowed, his breaths lengthened, and he permitted himself a moment to bathe in the sweet subsidence. His phone rang. He fished it from a sodden pocket and wiped the screen with a sleeve before answering. Ashley. Ashley's face, half covered by a tatty black and white gingham scarf, scowled. Grub, we're at the front. Where are you? I'm there, dude. I'm there. You look like shit. Her eyes betrayed further irritation. Have you had one of your attacks? They're just headaches, dude. He bit back a repost. No, man. No. I'm good. Get the hell out of there, man. Every person counts. You know that more than most. He grunted assent and hung up. The prospect of pushing and shoving through the crowd on his robotic leg unnerved him, and sweat prickled beneath his already sodden shirt. He probably stank like shit. Above all, doubt shook him madly. In the misty aftermath of his brainstorm, these protests seemed the epitome of futility. It's not for you. True, it was too late for him. Fighting the noon's Alicia, Psychotecture Europa Corporation wouldn't rescue Grub, but to others he was a symbol of corporate excess and impunity. To get justice, Grub had to be visible, and he did want justice. A burning, incandescent want to right the wrongs he'd suffered. He flexed his disfigured hand, phantasmic aches ghosting along his missing digits. Above him, Norston Grass's quasi-organic skyscrapers pulsed hideously. On some buildings, giant suckered tentacles writhed, shimmering deep burnished gold in the electric night. On others, aquatic creatures flapped their tails, which became teeth that chattered harsh electronica and metal and old classical songs in alien tongues, while elsewhere giant eyes blinked and rolled around like pool balls before vomiting out advertising slogans for cars and beers and other shit. On other buildings, the walls warped into titanic vertical lawns, sprouting lush verdant blades before yellowing and flickering into stubby frost that evaporated into the indigo air, ghosting past the bioluminescence of a million tiny submarine jellies shining up the walls of another. Then a man's face, smiling, handsome and bearded, grew from a building before shedding its facial hair, saying, We'll give you a really close shave! The ostentatious buildings in Zantrostrasse paraded the brashest of Norsengrass's OSR. It was also home of NEPE's headquarters, hence the protest gravitating here. As they thrashed and writhed above, his beautiful designs made Grub terribly sad. Before his accident, he'd taken great pride in having the designs for these constructs plucked from his mind, but now he despised them. He pulled his collar up and pushed through the crowd. His robotic leg meant anything faster than a walk sent wavy cramps up his real leg, but he shoved his way to the tip of the protest regardless. Here the voices were loudest, the passion fieriest, the collective discontent its most indignant. Men and women of all ages waved phones, placards and effigies of monstrous, quasi-organic mutations above their heads, screeching monotonously. Any P.E. tries to play at God, we put any P.E. to the sword. Okay. Litopians, report to the Genius Room right now. Genius.litopia.com Thank you very much, Litopians. Yes. Our own panel genius here is John, John Biggs. More dystopia? Can, how much dystopia can we can we take, do you think, John? Not very much more, I don't think. Um, but I mean, what else what else can you write in this uh, in this era? Yeah. Uh, no, nothing's, nothing's good happening. You can't really write a a heartwarming story about uh, Trump or Brexit. So, um, <laughs> uh. so I'm so I'm thinking about this one hard, and I like the I like the 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 I like it conceptually, but I think it was just a little bit muddled. 
Uh, mm. There's a lot there. And again, this is the kind of sci-fi that gets, if you're not, if you don't catch it immediately, then you're basically lost for the rest of the book. Uh, I was lost to the first pages. Yeah. Uh, cons- I like the concepts, but I just don't feel that, I, A, I don't feel like we're, I don't feel where we were. Um, mm. Nor do I quite understand the, the world yet. So it's uh, it's a pretty hard sell. Yeah, I like the concept. I, I like the um, the idea of a um, a psychitect. I think it's very interesting. Yeah, Georgina. You don't get first that. Reaction. You don't get that in those. You those don't. Pages. No, no, Georgina. Um, I yeah, it's not again not something I read, so I feel a little a little disoriented for that reason as well, but also because of the that's such a. a it was weird because there was a ton of information and the pay, and it was sort of erratic and kind of all over the place, yet it was kind of slow in a way. Like um, there was a lot of that, the internal stuff going on, but then mm. there's all this chaos around him, which you weren't aware of during the internal bits. And so all the, you know, the protests and the noises and the flashing buildings and all of that would sort of, they get lost and you yeah. forget about him. And you yeah. be him and his migraine, which isn't super exciting. Yeah. But then you suddenly decide to go back to the chaos, and you'd be like, "Oh yeah, right, chaos." So I, I, I yeah, I he, really imaginative. I thought um, I liked the descriptions, but it 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 didn't go together. The hole in the sky. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, it's a complex vision, isn't it? And um, I, yeah. I I like the blurb a lot. I'm quite excited by the blurb, but. Uh, like John, I felt a bit confused actually um, by the, the, the first few pages. And if you know, if you've got this great, obviously it's really clear in your head, Dan. But if you've got this this amazing big vision, you, you know, you have to you have to be organised about how you introduce us to it. Otherwise, it's just going to you know go over as like a tidal wave and go. What was that, um, John? Coming back to you, give us some numbers, please. I mean, I want to I want to support cyberpunk in all its forms, but I'm just giving it a. I have to lend with a two. Yeah, two. All right. Well, you've got to do what a man's got to do, Georgina. Mm. Um, I, I'm going to give it a three. Okay. Why is that? May I ask? Um, I, I was, like I said, I for me it was really imaginative and, mm. and visual, and I see all that, and I, you know. I think his writing was pretty good. He, he, I think he needed some pruning. He has a lot of really long, complex sentences. Yeah, in this really yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of erratic story that didn't quite work, but yeah. um, I don't know. I saw promise in it. Yeah, yeah, you're doing what I do all the time. I get told off by the chat room. Oh, I know. I, I, I just, I, yeah, I, I just get enthusiastic yeah. about something. So you're going for a three. Yeah. That's very good of you, but I'm going to, I'm on John's side of this. Oh. I know, I know. Sorry about that. Never mind, never mind. I'll tell you what we should do. We should probably go straight on and have a look at our third submission, see how we're doing there. We'll come to the uh, to the um, vote in just a second. There's been a slight technical issue there, but it's been sorted out now. Let's have a look at our next submission. And this is called Chronicles of a Mermaid. And it's a memoir. A memoir. Well, it's got to be a, by, by a, a real mermaid. That's very exciting. By Tiffany Burkitt. And there's the QR code there can't wait to dash off and see where that goes to and this is tiffany's blurb i wanted to change when i left la but moving to the country wasn't the friendly welcoming experience i dreamed it would be as my heart and my relationship held onto its last fraying thread i made a decision i quit my job i shoved my things into storage and i booked two one-way tickets to thailand why two you and your dog i was going to become a scuba diver. I was going to find my <laughs> can't read <really> that now. <laughs> my out of the hole. What? I was going to find my out of the hole I had lost myself in. Okay, yeah, I understand that. It's my exit really. And I was going to do it in an alien world beneath the sea. So what? If I didn't know how to swim. All right. Well, we got there eventually, didn't we? Let me tell everyone about Tiffany. Um, I'm a motorcycle racer, says Tiffany. My own personal mechanic, a scuba diver, a seasoned traveller, and a certified klutz. Currently working full time as a writer after a long career in software development. Ooh. My memoir series, Chronicles of a Motorcycle Gypsy, has been featured on ESPN. 
and is now available as, a, as an audiobook with both books hitting number one on Amazon's bestseller list several times since release. Okay, so what you need to tell us there is what category. Okay, because that's the thing about Amazon. Because the, the suggestion there, you're, you're not dealing with idiots here, Tiffany. The suggestion there is that it was all-time Amazon bestseller. If it really was, then you should say so. But actually, probably what it is, is within a very, very narrow genre that um, uh, people are constantly inventing genres and subgenres there, just so they can have number ones. I got my start as a travel writer for Motorcyclist magazine, the oldest running motorcycle publication in the world. And my other publications include an upcoming series of romance novels to be published by Nine Star press a multi-talented person quite clearly tiffany so we need a multi-talented narrator for you and that will be kate chronicles page. of a mermaid by tiffany read by kate the two things i've always feared most in life are drowning or being paralyzed so naturally i started scuba diving and racing motorcycles chapter one have you ever tried to get through 24 hours of flying with a smoker? The hour-long flight from Kalispell to Seattle wasn't so bad, though having to leave the airport for a smoke break and redo security on every layover wasn't my favourite. The 12-hour flight to Taiwan was worse. I think we broke up twice along the way. Taiwan has smoking rooms in the airport, so the seven-hour layover and the remaining two-hour flight to Thailand was only borderline. And they say women are moody. Fortunately, Hollywood, my impatient and nicotine-addicted boyfriend, remembered that he loved me once he took his first drag in the smoking room of Suwanaboom International Airport in Bangkok, Thailand. Which is good, because the customs line was long, and I wasn't looking to get arrested for murder in a foreign country quite this soon. So Adika, a woman, greeted us with a smile as she ushered us into the line for foreign passports. That basic greeting was the only phrase I knew in Thai, so as long as they never said anything after that, I would be solid. I wiggled out of my oversized backpack, all 60 litres filled with my entire life, and I dug for my passport. What is the purpose of your visit? The man at the immigration booth asked, as he fingered through pages and pages of Latin American stamps. He pressed his finger on the first blank page, then returned his attention back to me. I grinned, the question alone bubbling all of my enthusiasm to the surface scuba diving he considered me for a moment tossed me a nod then slammed a stamp onto the page so before i go any further let's clear up a few things some people like maybe eight of them might know me as that girl who has been traveling the world on a motorcycle in which case you might wonder why i'm here for scuba diving instead of riding to answer that question, it'll make more sense if you know where I'm coming from. How do you feel about Kalispell, Montana? I was staring at a Craigslist ad for a software development position in the Great White North when I popped the question to Hollywood. It was late at night in early October and we were crashing on a good friend's couch in Las Vegas. My savings account was tapped out after coming back to the States, having expunged 10 years of penny pinching for a two-year motorcycle trek, spanning some 60,000 miles over 49 states of the US, three provinces of Canada, 31 states of Mexico, and every country in Central America. But the fact that money was getting tight felt like far less of a crisis than figuring out where we would go to replenish it. I was native to Los Angeles, born in a hospital in Woodland Hills and having grown up in the San Fernando Valley. Hollywood was born in Haver, Montana, then lived most of his life in Colorado between Steamboat Springs, Loveland and Denver. We got together while in the thick of travelling on the aforementioned motorcycle trip, so in the year and a half we'd now been a thing, we had never tried to live together in a single stable place like a normal stable couple. There was little commitment in living moto homeless in a tent, knowing either one of us could go somewhere else at any moment. But to choose a place to opt into a full-time job and a lease? That was fucking scary. 
I knew Hollywood didn't want to live in Los Angeles and at the time I wasn't sure if I did either. My friends were there, motorcycle racing was there, lots of jobs were there, but it was crowded and expensive and at times a little suffocating. I had loved my life in LA, but what if I loved somewhere else more? If my adventures had taught me anything, it's that there's an incredible world outside my comfort zone and I was ready to give it a chance. Be part of today's live show in the YouTube chat room, yt.litopia.com. I see uh, Katie in the YouTube chat room has just said, more gloom, please. So, Georgina, at last we found something that you love. Yeah? <laughs> I've read a few memoirs. <laughs> okay. I like the okay. title. I like the title too, Cry. Yeah, I'd definitely pick that up. Absolutely. And... More mermaid, less flying in the aeroplane yeah. and backstory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah, it, it, I, the first part I was intrigued in the flight. I mean, like the chatty kind of carefree voice for a while. Um, but then uh, it suddenly goes back and gives this rather mundane backstory of where they're from and mm, doesn't really add anything to the story I'm expecting to read. Um, so, mm. and, and then that makes me think, well, what's the rest of the book going to be about? What's, what's, yeah. I mean, how is this going to sustain itself for a whole book? Mm. Yeah, I can't. I can't disagree yeah. with that. Actually, what do you? Um, yeah, what do, what do you say, John? First, are you into mermaids? Not specifically. Um, it's it's one of my it's one of my previous hobbies. Uh, hmm. I was a mermaid for a brief a brief time. Oh, um, lovely! <laughs> got my voice back. I got the I got the whole thing. Got okay, your legs thing, back as well. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah, I got my legs. Still, yeah, yeah. Still got a slightly <laughs> fishy I, smell. But, I don't know. Um, I mean, why doesn't why doesn't she just start with the being a mermaid? I want to be I want to be underwater with her, like drowning or totally. whatever, to actually totally. get me to be excited about this whole thing. I don't need to. Totally. I've I've been into an air, I've been in an airport before. That's not the uh, that's not the draw here. Exactly. And I also this Hollywood guy. Uh, maybe he's a real person. Maybe not. But I could probably do without him. Uh, give mm. me a eat, pray, love <laughs> as opposed to like some dude who needs to smoke. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. Actually, I mean the whole the whole thing. Unless you're marvelously famous, you know, Kardashian, in which case, yes, your your you know your 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 transit through um, an airport lounge w would be fascinating for millions of people, no doubt. Actually, but you know, yeah, people have been to airports before. Um, the whole thing is that it's got to be, if this is, you know, real life memoir, it's got to be punch after punch after punch. It's got to be amazing and so you've got to take us places that we normally never get to, have experiences we would normally never have. And it's, you've just got to start big and get even bigger. And you're not doing that. You're not doing that. We wanted you to. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, Georgina, numbers coming up, please. Oh, two. Two. This is a low-scoring show. It's extraordinary. A couple of yeah. weeks ago, it was way up there. Eighties, oh nineties, everybody. Yeah. yeah. I know. Um, oh, I, just as how the cookie crumbles, I guess. I don't know, John. This specific excerpt is just a one. Just yeah. go. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What am I going to say? It's a toss-up between one or two. Oh, I'm very generous. I like mermaids. <laughs> <laughs> you do get a chance right at the end if anybody wants to change that vote you can do that once you've seen all the submissions but um, uh -huh. I tell you what uh, let's have a look and see what the scoreboard's looking like so we have got scores in for the first two and maybe uh, yeah Chronicles of a Mermaid that will update in a moment just has done so it's not a high scoring show our first submission, Foreign Land, is leading, but it's only 55. And that does suggest there's lots of room for our final two submissions to overtake if they are going to do that. Very interesting. Um, but until before then, before we have a look at our last two submissions, I want to see what John Biggs is up to. And it's always incredibly hard summarising what John is doing. So there's a little ticker there you see on the screen there. I'll go on for about 15 or 20 minutes <laughs> <laughs> describing everything he's been up to. Uh, you've got a book out, Get Funded. Yep. You write fiction and non-fiction. That's your most recent Get Funded. What's that about, John? Uh, it's about getting funded. So uh, no. I was, uh, I was, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, this, this was an interesting thing. And my agent, 
I was talking with the editor, um, and I worked with my agent to just basically make this specifically for people who are trying to get funded for, I don't know, uh, startups, for even book projects, for uh, hardware projects, that sort of thing. Hmm. So my buddy and I got together and we just used the best of our experiences uh, pitching. Um, I used to work for TechCrunch, which was a get, which was a tech site um, yeah. uh, about startups. So I used a lot of my experience from coaching startups on how to, how to build this book out. So that was about, uh, I guess, nine months of work, and we got it together. Uh, and it just came out in August, I believe. A very necessary book, I'm absolutely sure. Let's have a look at your other books to date. Is that everything so far, or have got a few more tucked up your sleeve? Uh, I've got a few more coming. Uh, I have a little horror novella that I'm working on, and, uh, mm. and I'm working on another thing about working from home uh, with a pretty big uh, wow. with a pretty big CEO. So I want to be doing a doing a yes, um, another, another incredibly uh, contemporary subject. There. Mm -hmm. So um, you make a transition between fiction and nonfiction very easily. You also, I think, I'm not sure if this is true. It's, um, have you been traditionally published? Sometimes people call it legacy publishing, um, yeah, and yeah, self. Yeah, yeah. You've done both. You've done both. Yeah, I've done both. Mm -hmm. Which do you prefer? Oh, gosh. I mean, look, at this point in the game, you're not going to get much distribution from a legacy publisher. You're not going to get much backup. You're not going to get much advertising. It's all it's all you're doing it yourself anyway. Uh, if they were flying me around to give readings or whatever, then then maybe I'd be much more interested in, uh, in doing traditional publishing. Uh, but thus far, the the in terms of cash, I've gotten nice advances uh, for the for the traditional books. But I've gotten pretty much the same equivalent in terms of cash for the for the self published. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm not gonna. I'm not going to choose just yet. I like I like my agent. I like working with uh, with people who are actually professional about this stuff. Um, but if you can self-publish, by all means, do it. The trick with self-publishing is that you really have to you have to get an editor, you have to get copy editor, developmental editor. Um, I write about it. Uh, I've written about it a couple times. Just how to hmm. how to find all those people. And how do you how um, do you how do you allow your readers to find you? How do you how do you cope with the, the challenge of discovery? Uh, I have a pretty big Twitter following. I used to have a I used to have a um, I used to have a Facebook page, but I deleted Facebook because it was awful. You um, deleted Facebook? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Was that of sort of ethical reasons? It's just I mean there was no there was no benefit to being on there. Wow. I had five thousand followers. I could I could post I could post whatever. I had five thousand friends, right? So I could post uh, one of my friends. new books out today. Friends. Were they all good friends? Yeah, exactly. Ah. Oh, yeah, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful friends. I could post this is this just happened today. I'm like here, buy my book. Nothing. I would get no. I would get uh -huh. no pickup. There's no conversion. So if I'm going to use this thing for what it's what it's kind of for in terms of, as a writer, it's for broadcast. So broadcasting didn't work for me, and the hmm. only benefit that I got out of it was to see I don't know my my sister's kids happy or something like that so yeah i decided uh, i decided to maybe just give him a call and so there, there is a faustian pact that you engage with not everyone knows this of course but you would above anyone else right with with facebook because they they say yeah come and use all, mm -hmm. you know everything you want and we'll just we'll learn everything we will fingerprint yeah, you yeah, yeah. everywhere you go so they've got enormous amounts of data on john biggs and everybody else that they but are I, using I for my... questionable purposes right for advertising, for targeting. I mean, any any post that you have up there uh, is not for human beings. It's 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 great for uh, it's great for the first couple first couple days. The rest of the time, the robots are basically reading everything that you've posted previously. That <sighs> stuff can be used against you if you're if you're angry at somebody. That stuff can be used uh, that can be used in, uh, to uh, prevent you from getting a job, to prevent you po po entering politics, all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, it's very so scary stuff. Delete, yeah, it's very scary. I delete all my I delete all my tweets older than two weeks. Uh, delete all the tweets older than two weeks, and I deleted Facebook, and that's basically all I use. I mean, I'm watching TikTok just uh, melt the minds of a, the next generation. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, why does I'm why is this? In. Okay, so what what's at the bottom? Why why does the internet seem to bring out the very worst in people? Uh, because it allows for un untrammeled id. Um, I can hmm. get on here. I can get on the internet, and I can say everybody sucks, and you suck, and the, uh, I don't know, Trump is great, and also the garbage or the, or the opposite. And I can do it in a way that's as offensive as I want, versus a versus being able to go out into the street. And if if I went on the street and said the same things that I would say on the internet, most people would say on the internet, I get punched, right? Uh, <laughs> I can sit behind my computer 
and I can feel I can feel empowered and I can also feel like I'm communicating with the world when the communi- a the world isn't listening to you by uh-huh. any stretch of imagination yeah. and b you're in a situation that that it's actually puts you into danger it actually makes you a it makes you a pawn in a game that you have no under, you have under, no understanding of so it's actually so you very frustrating. St- you I used to, I was just checking this today. You used to have a, a podcast called Ta- Technotopia. That's you've mm-hmm. now changed the title to Tech Hygiene. Is, mm-hmm. Does that reflect what you've just been saying? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I've always been a techno-utopianist. I believe that technology can fix a lot of things. I mean, a lot of my books uh, talk about that in one way or the other. Um, the mechanical watches changed the way we were able to uh, to cross the ocean. We actually we sure, discovered yeah. new new lands. So that's one of the things. That's that's how I that's how I see technology. Uh, but being a being optimistic about the whole thing is fairly difficult right now. So I'm just trying to help us stay sane. Yeah. Uh, while all of these changes are going on around us. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I'm, I mean, there's so much to talk to you about, but I just see from your, in your early days, you were a cook, an eyeglass grinder, <laughs> and a waiter. All right. Yeah. So, which, which one of those did you learn the most from, and what did you learn? I think being a waiter was the best. Was mm, the best. I, I worked in a, uh, in a retirement yeah. home, yeah. So, I worked with, I worked with uh, older folks. I met a 98-year-old lady who, who taught me old folk songs. She told me about the stories about how they pulled the old schoolhouse uh, down the road because they wanted to move it. They just put lift it up, put it on some wheels, and had an ox yeah. drag the thing down the road. She tells me this story, and that was that was when I was fairly I was I was into Bob Dylan. I felt like we could run like be a hobo on the rails or whatever back yeah, in '90 yeah. something. Yeah. Uh, and it was really, really fun, and uh, and I got to meet a lot of nice, nice people with a lot of stories to tell. Yeah, maybe you'll write about it. Maybe you will. Mm-hmm. In your spare time, laughable mm-hmm. expression for John Biggs. Uh, catch up the scoreboard one more time. Yeah, that's how it's looking. Fifty-five percent, lots of headroom there. Maybe our next submission is the one that's going to bust it wide open, and it's Natch. It's Echo Fiction. How terribly appropriate. It's from Tim. Tim Pfaff, I think. I'm sorry, Tim. I'm, sh- I'm sure people do that all the time to you, actually. How absolutely unbearable of me. I, I do apologise. QR code there. Go off and see what Tim wants you to look at. And this is Tim's blurb. At the Department of Notable Ancestry, the folks upstairs have charged the Echo Design Team with the redesign of the Far South after the big melt. The big fever... And the big gasp, internet fail. Nate and Nurt lead an iconic, if rebellious, team that must repopulate a continent while including the much despised Homps, Homps, Homo sapiens, who released all that carbon. Natch, I like the title, encourages readers to reconsider who is steering the lifeboat and leaves them with an entirely new perspective on the Batmobile. <laughs> on the Batmobile. On the Batmobile. Okay. Uh, let me tell you about him. My career in design, <clears throat> excuse me, spans more than three decades as an exhibit developer. I craft stories for natural and cultural history museums. Recent projects include the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum in Jackson. The Idaho State Museum in Boise and the National Museum of African American Music, currently under construction in Nashville. Previous publications include three award winning books on regional history. Uh, My self published the. uh, (laughs) This is where you get your revenge on me, isn't it? The Pfaffenhofen, I think think that's how you say it. Uh, (laughs) The Pfaffenhofen Project, currently available on iTunes and Amazon. I'm almost also an accomplished songwriter and share music and short essays on my website, which no doubt is that QR code there too. So, an accomplished man of many talents. We need to match that, don't we? With our reader, and I'm pleased to say we are, because there's Robert. The first page. Natch by Tim. Read by Robert. Kickoff meeting, day one. Our story takes place in a location not very far away somewhere between the folks upstairs and the basement types. It was a time somewhere in between dinosaurs and Homo toastiasus, who evolved in the extremely warm climate that followed Homo sapiens. It is difficult to be more precise than that. The department's work was ancient and far-flung, as well as recent and local. 
Only the folks upstairs know the whole story, and they've always been a bit too mysterious for my taste. You never know what they will do, or why. They hardly ever give interviews, and when they do, well, let's just say you can only read so much into a burning bush. And no amount of prayers, candles, incense, goats, or good deeds seems to ever produce any results that could in any way be described as reliable. So, I stopped counting on them a long time ago. Besides, there's more than enough around here to keep a mind occupied. Who am I? They call me Scribe. I am the one who writes things down. Or types. I'm not a Luddite. Whatever gets the job done. Chisel, quill, fountain pen, typewriter, number two pencil, laptop. My job is to set down a record of what happened and who did what. So that in the future, if any of the folks upstairs want an accounting, they never have, by the way, I can say, here, and hand it to them. Our story begins, as stories often do, on the first day. No, not the first day, as in, in the beginning, yada yada yada, let there be light. No, this was the first day of two interns, Jean and Jean, who were starting at the DNA, Department of Notable and Ancestry, or the Department of Never Answering, as some callers have complained, the Department of Non-Stop Anxiety, as those who opted for early retirement call it, or the Department of Non-Budgeted Amendments, as some contractors have stipulated. In truth, I was never really told what the DNA actually stood for. Everyone had a theory. Everyone always has a theory. But the folks upstairs never really seemed to care what we called it. So we all started calling it the Department, or just Dina. Short and sweet. You'll find that I'm big on short and sweet. Jean and Jean didn't know each other on that very first day. They were meeting for the first time by happenstance, the coffee cart outside the massive department headquarters. On that day, happenstance was on the east side of the building, closest to nature, the plant shop. On some days, the coffee cart was on the west side, closest to nurture, the educational toy store. No one ever seemed to know when or why. It was just happenstance. Somehow, Lucky always seemed to know. So he was usually the one assigned to pick up the muffins each morning. Happenstance had good muffins. On that very first day, Jean was standing behind Jean, waiting in line for coffee. Jean liked his with, liked his with soy milk. Jean preferred skim. It was a blustery morning. As they waited, they saw Lucky chasing his hat down the sidewalk. The wind blew his hat up and down and up and down and up and down the white marble steps. The hat bounced into a planter where it ruffled the petals of some pink and yellow and red tulips and daffodils before wafting onto the feet of a statue standing in the middle of a fountain. It was the statue of Knot, Nathaniel Obadiah Temple, the great building's architect. Not had been so pleased with himself after completing the Dina design that he decided to add a statue outside the Welcome Plaza. The folks upstairs didn't really seem to care, and no one inside Dina could agree on whom the statue should represent. Whimsy had some fun notions. Thena submitted a provocative list of brainstorms. Destiny ranted about something that had been long preordained and pouted when no one paid attention. In the end, Not grew tired of waiting and decided to make it a self-portrait. Well, that's very interesting. He just stopped there. I've got another 1 minute 31 seconds on the clock here, but he just stopped. Leave a comment for today's authors on YouTube. They want to know what you think. Yes, they do, and I want to know what John Biggs thinks. Oh, man. Um, it's... I don't know, that was pretty rough. Mm. I had a yeah. lot of goodwill in the chat room to begin with, actually. Yeah. And yeah, so the shades of Sagler Douglas Adams, it wasn't funny. Uh, shades of, I don't know, like a, like a, I don't know, Margaret Atwood kind of thing with her, like, Corks and Crake weirdness just didn't hit uh there's mm -hmm. a lot missing 
uh, and you really don't like anything uh, in it, unfortunately, which is yeah. kind of like I don't know. I mean, it's it's mean to say, but it's just it's just rough. All right. So I thought my own feeling. Um, uh, I think it's Katie in the YouTube chat room said um, over, overload of archness. Somebody else said cheesy. Um, mm -hmm. I wrote down too much whimsy. Um, that's my own reaction. But uh, initially, a lot of people in the chat room were going, yeah, this is great. I, I love the feeling of this. Yeah, it's uh, another Terry Pratchett. So it's a difficult, isn't it? Because it, is, it, is it your own personal preference? Or actually, is there a real market out there? We don't know. Yeah, you know, if is this is if this if this is sort of like a comedy sci-fi maybe, the, but it just didn't it didn't hit on any of the any of the expected. Even if you want to go if you want to go to the tropes, you didn't get any of the good mm. tropes. You didn't have yeah. any like the. It wasn't a catch point too. It just didn't. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. You, yeah, you, yeah. You, you, I, I was I wasn't there wherever this place was and yeah and I don't yeah. know, I don't know how to get. There. Yeah. So Barbara, I think, in the chat room said, not sure where this is going. And I think, well, also, I think Barbara said, we need some stories soon. And I think that's bang on. But maybe, maybe, Georgina, this really floated your boat. <laughs> I did giggle a bit at the beginning. You giggle. There you um, go. It, yeah. That's um, what we like. It went on for a bit. I don't know. It reminded me of Monty Python skin. Oh, that's, that's good. Skin. That's good. You know? Um, so I, I maybe there's a, an audience for this. It, it's not me, but but that's okay. I'm kind of specific about what I like, so it doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> Pete yeah. nods. Um, yeah. No, but um, I, um, yeah, it just it got overly playful, I think, to where it became uh, you, you lost investment because it it. It wasn't clever anymore. It was just yeah silly. <laughs> yeah, I think that I think the word arch is rather good actually. I think yeah. I mean yeah, as far as I'm concerned. But I mean, it is it does raise an interesting issue, of course, as to whether publishers can or do or or, or could in fact publish material that they personally don't like, but they think there's a market for. Um, yeah. And generally speaking, publishers just buy what they like actually. That's usually what they do. And quite often, when they get into trying to second guess what other people think. It's going to be cool. They often get it wrong, but they often get it wrong in any case. <laughs> uh, John, points, please. I've, I've got my tin tin helmet on here. I think we're going to go really low. Are we? I think it's go for a one. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, luckily we don't provide a zero. I think John would have gone for that. He'd have gone for the yeah. thermonuclear option. No, no, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to discourage anyone from writing by any stretch of imagination. But there's, no. there's some. There's limits to it. To yeah, patience. yeah, yeah. I, I think. I, I think Barbara's actually right. Let's have some story, mate. All right. Enough of the archness, uh, Georgina. Yeah. Um, a two for the giggles and the natch. The title. You, right, Georgina giggle. Yeah. Titles all right. Uh, initially good reactions there, but you know, it's interesting how things changed. I'm going to go for a two. I'm being, I'm being quite kind, really, being quite positive. Let's have a look at the, uh, the scoreboard. It'll take a second or two just to update that, but we are not. We're not going to have a high scoring show yet. Yeah, so I think, yeah, what it's 40, so it's been going down all the time, actually. <laughs> It's just been getting down. Oh dear, oh dear. Let's see what we can do, shall we, for the, uh, the last submission of the day. Oh, buddy, buddy, it's all in your hands, mate. You're going you to have to save this show, all right? Comedy, yeah. We, if you make Georgina titter, then obviously we're going, we're going to score you very high. It's called Shackled. This is your blurb. Twin brothers Harry and Charlie are days from their 40th birthday. They bicker like kids, despite the fact only one of them was born alive. Charlie was stillborn, but ever since has been trapped in between worlds, making Harry's life a misery. Harry finally drafts in a medium, a beautiful woman, whose clairvoyant gift means she can also see and hear Charlie. Harry really wants his brother released into the afterlife, but when both twins fall in love with her, Charlie decides he's going nowhere. Oh, Randall and Hopkirk, eh? <clears throat> Stating me. Let me tell you about uh, Buddy. 
Uh, having written a couple of thriller novels, I'm gradually tidying up for submissions. Shackled is my first attempt at comedy. I'm a fan of Carl Hyerson and love his comedic attention to detail. Well, well. Um, why don't we get Litopia's own details man, otherwise known as Michael Caine, otherwise known as Jeff, to read it. The first page. Shackled by Buddy, read by Jeff. Chapter 1, The Night Before. If it wasn't for expected visitors, Harry Dilbeck would never have crawled out from the safe cocoon of his bed. With his liver still marinating in pina colada, he eased himself slowly down the stairs towards his twin brother, who was waiting at the bottom, smirking. The headache got more intense with every step, a blaring pulse behind his eyes like a heartbeat wired to a bass speaker. Look at the state of you, said Harry, tutting. Don't go near that window, you'll lower health prices. Harry ignored the remark. He delicately made his way to the kitchen and lunged a shaky finger at the switch on the kettle, missed and sprung for it again. It clicked on impact. He groaned and squeezed the bridge of his nose as he reached for the milk. He garbled some down straight from the container with a couple of aspirin. The result felt chalky and unpleasantly warm, and he immediately pulled a face to indicate his disgust. Swilling around his mouth, he darts his bloodshot eyes sideways towards Charlie, who has now stood at the other end of the kitchen. Charlie grims back. Nice hangover, princess. Harry grunts, ignoring the sarcasm, and shovels coffee and three heaped teaspoons of sugar into a mug. His head was spinning and his tongue felt like a junkie's carpet. His 40th birthday was only two days away and the accompanying depression was sinking in fast. He makes coffee and grabs a bag of chocolate onion rings from the freezer. He slowly takes a seat and balances the bag on his pounding head. Two days to go to a big full ow, said Charlie, chirpily appearing barely an inch from Harry's left ear. Harry waves a hand up, like he's batting away an annoying fly and carefully positions his nostrils above the rising steam from the mug. He skillfully adjusts the onion rings to fit the contours of his aching skull. You were out slamming tequila shots at the Bongwagogo Club with that fat loser across the road last night, in case you were wondering, said Charlie, noticing his brother's vacant expression. Harry groans and takes a slow gulp of coffee. The onion rings miraculously remain in place. He distantly remembers being out with Trev, his drinking buddy and illegal business partner. They were celebrating making a nice return on a range of stolen fragrances recently acquired from a late night super drug ram raid. Harry takes another throw of coffee as a flashback from the previous night at the Caribbean club enters his head. Himself and Trev were murdering a reggae classic on karaoke. The flashback brings with it a distant taste of rum in the back of Harry's throat. He squirms at the thought and his eyes will start to itch as some defrosted ice water runs down his face. You two were dancing around like a pair of fucking idiots, continues Charlie, flapping your arms around like a 50-year-old boy band. Charlie starts giggling and mockingly struts around the kitchen like an ostrich attempting flight. Harry seizes the opportunity and quickly makes a break for the shower. He quickly heads back upstairs, leaving his oblivious brother prancing about laughing to himself. The onion rings rode Harry's dome until the last three steps from the top, an impressive feat he couldn't repeat again if he tried. He strips off in one move and steps into the bath under the mould-ridden shower head, bravely willing to accept whatever temperature fate decides to punish him with. The initial blast of icy water caused Harry's penis to instantly retreat backwards into the warm safety of his wild pubic hair. He automatically sucks back a deep intake of breath at the shock of the temperature and spins around so the gradually warming spray bounced off his pale, freckle splattered shoulder blades. Harry looks up to see Charlie stood at the bathroom door, laughing. Can I not get a fucking second of peace here? shouts Harry, squeezing some shoplifted Vidal's Sassoon shampoo into his hands. Don't forget any other regions, said Charlie, nodding towards Harry's bush. Looks like Bob Marley's giving you a shoulder carry. Make a priority submission at priority.latopia.com. So, John, I was not expecting Harry's penis at that moment, were you? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. What happened this year, or this this week? Did it? What oh, no. was the was, was the submission system broken? No, it's you. <laughs> it, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knew you were coming on, that's why. 
<laughs> oh my god. Um, well, that, that did take me by surprise. Actually, I suddenly got went into pure big parts I actually didn't want to get into and never was expecting to to experience. But there you go. That's oh my what god! If that's what you want, if that's if that's if that's the story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it just seemed like last la- last time I was on this was like the beginning of beginning of summer. It was like interesting stories written by yeah. by people who really loved their specific genres. This is like something happened. I don't know. <laughs> it's COVID. <laughs> COVID. <laughs> Everybody's home and they're just going nuts. Exactly. Just, uh, exactly. Exactly. Whatever's, whatever's coming out of their brains. We've had a Rudy Giuliani moment, all of us, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So, I mean, should we just cut? To the, you don't need to say any more. Just give some numbers. Or a number. Maybe. I mean, I think the premise was okay. I mean, I would like to have like a, like a, whatchamacallit, what was that movie with Jeremy Irons? Was that Jeremy Irons or the other one? Remember that movie where the guy dies and his and his wife is being haunted by him the whole time? Oh yeah, well that's a trope that's British been going movie? on for decades, yeah. isn't it? Oh, but, uh, but having your brother, like that. yeah, having your brother, uh, having your brother do that to you, it sounds pretty fun. Yeah, uh, the, the the premises I think would work. I just think whatever happened in this section, I need to hear about this guy's uh, wiener and his head and his hangover. Like I need a hole in the head. <laughs> Yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll give it a I'll give it a two. I'll give it a two. All right, okay. Yeah, it was great reading. Thank you, Jeff. I mean, I don't want to, just wanted yeah, to yeah. say, yeah, Georgina, you're one of our narrators too. It's just fantastic. Uh, everyone really gets behind, you know, the the piece and they do, they try so hard. So, uh yeah, anything you want to add to that, Georgina? <laughs> I I thought Jeff's reading was great. And that actually made me laugh the way you read it. But, um, okay, that's good. It make you laugh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, but was this, was this the, the the romance, the comedy romance? I don't think so. It it's comedy. I don't was think it it's romance. I, don't, I, I think mean, it was just comedy. Remember, he yeah. did thrillers before. Yeah. But, yeah. but didn't they both fall in love with the medium woman? Oh yeah, the that's, that's that's coming. That's yes, yes. I, I, this is another one where I actually really prefer the blurb to the execution. Actually, yeah, I like exactly. that. I like the idea. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Numbers? So, you want my number? Yeah, two. Aww. Two. Yeah. I like the blurb, so I also am going to go Aww. for two. <sighs> right, so, I mean, we just take them as they come, guys. That's what we do. It's it's not actually John Biggs' fault, although I'm going to tell him it is. Um, I, you know, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take, the, I'll take the L. Don't worry about it. But just... Uh, uh. Next time I come on, I want to see. Uh, I want to see some Tolstoy. <laughs> Just pull your pull your socks up, chaps, eh? When John, yes, hands <laughs> above. Come on, dear, oh dear. We don't want to let the side down here, do we? No, no. Let's have a look at the final score. This has got to be uh, the lowest. It's so strange. This has got to be the lowest scoring show we've ever had. Only two or three weeks um, above the highest scoring show. And, you know, I mean, that's how it happens. That's how the cookie crumbles. We take submissions in the order they come in. And some weeks it's fabulous. And other weeks it's not so fabulous. But we have got we have got a winner there. Um, let me... Now we're going to ask our two panellists if they want to change any of their votes. And you cannot go into minus numbers, guys. Jacob gave us Foreign Land. Dan gave us The Hole in the Sky, great title. Tiffany gave us Chronicles of a Mermaid, another good title. Tim gave us Natch. And Buddy, you've just seen that. Buddy gave us Shackled. And I'm going to say, Georgina, do you want to reconsider your numbers for any one of those submissions? If you do, speak now. No. No, okay. fair enough. John. No, just, no, just leave him. That's fine. He just, wants, he just wants to go away. You can go home in a minute, John. Actually, you are home. <laughs> don't worry. He just wants to go. He's been very good. Right, All right. So that's how it looks, guys. It's up to you now. If you're the wanker who's been messing with our vote, please don't. We're going to implement more security procedures right now. So, you know, don't spoil other people's fun. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Uh, I've enjoyed myself today. Uh, you've heard, you've had the wonderful John Biggs, who is always great value for money. The amazing Georgina Kay. It's nice to see her, apart from here sometimes. All the wonderful people behind the scenes who make 
pop-up submissions what it is. What is it? <laughs> I've had fun. You have six and a half days in which to vote to express your uh, your preference for any one of those submissions. And guys, let's meet up again same time next week. Good night. Cats and words, callous words, trying to drive a wedge between us. Lonely mornings, secret codes, I just gave up keeping the score. Slander or liars, nothing can stop us, baby. This is a time. Open the show